Hello everyone, I recently celebrated this channel's first birthday and as a way to celebrate I wanted to look back on my first video which was on Renala. This video was a very brief overview of the boss fight specifically. It covered some symbolism but not enough about Renala's character. So join me this time as we start at the beginning to cover the rise and fall of Queen Renala. Now, unlike her current title suggests, Renala wasn't always royalty. She was most likely born into the Karian family, who were not technically a royal family at the time. And the basis I'm using to discover what Renala's childhood was like is from this talisman. On it, we see a small girl against the backdrop of a starry sky. The young astrologer gazed at the night sky as she walked. She'd always chase the stars every step of her journey. But how do we know that this is Renala? Well, the talisman goes on to say that she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen. But what exactly happened in between these two events? Well, the talisman mentions that she discovered the moon, or specifically that she met the moon. Almost like the moon is a person, a living entity of its own. It was this that Renala dedicated her life to, studying it closely, harnessing its power, and as a result, there is a spell that exists which transforms the caster into an incarnate full moon. Queen Renala encountered this enchanting moon when she was young, and later it would bewitch the academy. Something about this moon was special, it captivated whoever laid eyes on it, and being able to become a vessel of the moon was something spectacular, something that caught the attention of a certain academy dedicated to the study of magic. This academy in question is Rhea Lucaria Academy, but how did the young girl find her way there? Well, if you look closely at the talisman, you can see that Renala isn't just looking at any star, she's looking at a shooting star, a falling star. What she could have witnessed here was the founding of the Glenstone Sorcery, the eldest primeval sorcery said to have been discovered by an ancient astrologer. Now, an important distinction to make is the difference between sorcerers and astrologers. You see, glintstone sorcerers came after astrologers. They are the descendants of astrologers, a fact that Karians remain aware of. And astrology is what the Karian family specialised in. According to the description of the telescope, this was a tool used by the members of the Karian royal family. So one day, a Karian astrologer was looking through a telescope saw something spectacular, a rain of stars from the heavens, thought to be the founding glintstone sorcery. The glimpse of the primeval current that the astrologer saw became real, and the star's amber rained down on this land. This is why Leonia is covered in these blue shards. They are the amber of the stars, the remains of that day when glintstones were introduced to the lands between. Now what happened next, I'm going to speculate entirely to fill in any gaps. The Karian astrologer could have taken the glintstones to the nearby academy, the Academy of Rayla Karia, for them to study. Or the astrologist started the academy. There are two characters, Master Lasat and Ezio, who were described as founding glintstone sorcerers, as in founders of the academy. So where does Renala come into this? It could be that Renala followed the direction of the reigning stars, like she's depicted doing so in the talisman, as the Karian manor where she would have been residing is very close by to the academy. However, as for the timeline, it's a little unclear as when Renala arrived at the academy, because based on what I'm about to say next, it sounds like the academy had already been established for some time. But once there, she demonstrated what she had learnt from studying the stars and the lunar spell that she had been bestowed with. And as the spell detailed, the scholars were bewitched. They had no choice but to take her in, allow her to join the academy as an esteemed colleague at such a young age. It's because there was a statue created to commemorate her, the prodigy that was Renala, here outside the Grand Library of Freya Lucaria. We can see a young girl. And what leads me to believe that this girl is Renala is because of what she is wearing. 
long robes with a distinctive pattern down the midsection. These robes were only given to the highest ranking sorcerers, masters of the glintstone arts. And the reason why we know this is because that same pattern can be found on the robes of Master Lassat and Asha, a robe reserved for Grandmasters at the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. What Renala managed to accomplish at such a young age was extraordinary. But she didn't stop there. Renala was a prominent champion who charmed the Academy with her lunar magic, become its master. She also led the Glintstone Knights and established the House of Caria as royalty. These Glintstone Knights, Carian Knights, or also known as Enchanted Knights, were anointed by the Lunar Queen. And interestingly, Enchanted Knights were actually a starting class during Elden Ring's closed network test. However, they were removed as a class when the game was fully released, perhaps because their starting stats were, in my opinion, pretty strong. Or perhaps, for a lore reason, there weren't that many Enchanted Knights in existence. These knight swords could serve as catalysts, letting them wield sorcerous battle skills, despite numbering fewer than 20. So it could be that they were removed as a playable class to preserve their uniqueness and the rarity of their existence. An example of one of the last remaining Karian knights is Moongrum, the hostile NPC who is guarding the elevator to Renala's boss room. Traditionally, in real life, to become a knight, you must first be officially appointed by a monarch or head of state. And as the enchanted knights were explicitly anointed by the Lunar Queen, Renala, she must have already become a queen at this point to do so. So how exactly did she become queen? Like I said earlier, she wasn't born into royalty, as the description stated that she was the one to establish Caria as a royal family which would imply that they weren't already. But can you just decide one day that you are royal without having any birthright? Well, you can't, but other people as a collective can make that decision. In the British Sovereign Succession Rules, it states that Parliament, the governing body of the country, can decide to give an individual a royal title. They can also choose to strip one of their title. So returning back to Elden Ring, Renala, with all of her accomplishments, impressed the Academy so much that they decided to award her with the royal title and establish her whole family as royals. Now, the Karian family is described as also being the heads of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. So this could very much be an I'm giving myself an award situation. But what's important to remember is that the Academy and the Karians are two separate entities. Renala acts as the bridge between them. She's the Queen of Caria, but she is also the governor of the academy. Now at some point, a war broke out known as the Second Leonian War, a raging battle between the royal Carian family and Radigan's army. This is where Radigan met Lady Renala in battle. Now what exactly was the cause for the war in the first place? Well, I believe it was Radigan who declared war on the Carians because they were overseeing the Academy's research and practice of glintstone sorcery. The battle art you've learned is of the glintstone family. In the past, they obeyed laws which contravened the Golden Order, or so I'm told. Contravene meaning these sorceries were quite literally violating the law. Regier then goes on to say that this is not the law in the current day. The Golden Order accepts the use of glintstone magic now. But in the past, this went against the beliefs of the Golden Order. And as a result, Radigan was dispatched to lead an army against those who encouraged its use. And the battle wasn't at all one-sided. Renala, although her forces were smaller, held her own. If you remember those enchanted knights, we get an idea of their strength and abilities from the description of the sword. Despite numbering fewer than 20, this power made them a match for even the champions of gold in battle. So this was a pretty much equal fight, because there was no overwhelmingly victorious side. The war appeared to end in a stalemate. 
We learn this from a sword monument which details the war. The Second Leonian War. No victory for the golden, nor for the moon. No prize but atonement, the birth of a vow. The vow mentioned here is the vow of matrimony. A ceasefire was called. What is up for debate is whether this was a political marriage. If both sides agreed to join in holy matrimony, then there would be peace, no more fighting, which could be one incentive for getting married. But did they just simply fall in love? We don't know how long this war actually lasted. It could have been love at first sight, or a slow burn of enemies turning to lovers. Regardless, the two of them married, and Radigan swore loyalty to Renala, seeking absolution for declaring war on her in the first place, and they went on to have three children together. All seem perfect, a consummated, loving marriage, but nothing could have prepared Renala for what was to come next. Radigan left Renala to return to the Erdtree capital, becoming Queen Marika's second husband and King Consort, taking the title of Second Elden Lord. The mystery endures to this day as to why Lord Radigan would cast Lady Renala aside. One day, Radigan decided he couldn't be with Renala any longer decision that would leave an everlasting wound in the Queen's heart. This is where the theory I mentioned earlier about the political marriage comes back into play. If Radigan did marry Renala for this reason, it would explain why he had no grievances up and leaving her, especially if he had been offered a more attractive deal. That offer being, as Muriel said, to return to the capital and become husband to Queen Marika. So if Radigan was only using Renala, he did so to avoid losing a war. Then he spent his married life gaining access to Renala's academy, learning the ways of the Clintstone arts, and finally fathering three powerful offspring, Rikard, Radan, and Rai. And once his ruler, Marika, ordered him to return, he brought back everything he had acquired and learnt, the newly found magic knowledge and three powerful demigod children, one of them, Rani, being powerful enough to potentially become Marika's successor. This is if we are viewing Radigan's motivations from the perspective that he genuinely never loved Renala. But if he did, then sadly his personal feelings wouldn't have mattered in the grand scheme of things. He had to obey Marika's orders. I like to think that Radigan did love Renala. And there are a couple of actions that he did before he left that may indicate so. Firstly, he left something to protect her. It's wolf. There is a giant red wolf in the debate parlour in the academy. It's a strange location to stumble across the massive animal. When you think about it, the debate parlour is the closest point of grace to Renard's boss room, her current location. So it's possible that Radigan ordered his loyal guardian stay and protect Renala, should anyone try to hurt her. And also an indicator of his love, Radigan gave her a parting gift, the Amber Egg. I will explain what the Amber Egg is, but for now, bear in mind that this gift was both incredibly meaningful and powerful. Radigan didn't have to give anything to Renala, but he clearly cared enough to do so. But despite a potentially sweet farewell, Renala was left heartbroken, and rightly so. Imagine, if you will, that one day your significant other tells you that they are leaving you. You previously had no relationship issues, you had a happy marriage, beautiful, successful children, and then, if that wasn't enough to process, your partner, now ex, moves on immediately to marry another person. We can assume that Renala did not take this news well. We don't know if she wept for how long, how she mourned for her lost love exactly. We do know that she coped in one unhealthy way. That farewell gift was the last thing that Radigan had left to Renala, and as a result, she became fixated on it, obsessed over it. So what exactly is the amber egg? Well, the amber part refers to sap, 
from the Erd tree, and this dried tree resin is treasured as the most precious of jewels, not only because of its appearance, but also because it is believed that primordial life energy resides inside. And inside of the egg made of amber is a great rune, quite the gift. We get confirmation of this from Gideon. Renala is queen of the Carian royals who govern the academy, and her great rune dwells within the egg she so dearly clutches. What is also important to note is that Radigan willingly gave her a great rune, a component that we know makes up the Elden Ring. Radigan's whole agenda is that he's trying to repair the Elden Ring after it was shattered by Marika. So if he has a great rune, why would he then give it away? Unless this shard wasn't originally part of the Elden Ring. Or perhaps Radigan created this one especially for Renala. It's not clear either way, but what is clear is that this rune, the Great Rune of the Unborn, is different from the other great runes that we receive. With this rune, we have no way of using it, nor is there a divine tower that can activate its power. The sole purpose of this rune is to unlock the respecking mechanic, and I think this serves as an explanation as to why Radigan didn't have any problem giving it away, because I don't think this rune has the same significance as the runes that the Elden Ring is comprised of. But what was Radigan's motive? Why did he give Renala something like this? Well, the name of the rune, like I said, is the Great Rune of the Unborn. And the Unborn here is Unborn Demigods. The fact that this rune is embedded in a sizable lump of amber which has life energy, it would allow Renala to birth these Unborn Demigods. But who exactly? And as usual, I have a couple of theories, and we shall start with the more outlandish of the two. When you try and look closely at the amber egg clipping through the model, you can see what looks like strands of red hair. And if this is indeed hair, then we only know one person responsible for genetics like these, and that is Radigan. So did Radigan give Renala the materials to make a clone of him? I said it would be outlandish, but stay with me here. Radigan knew that Renala would be devastated at his departure, so to try and quell her sadness, he gave her the means to create a Radigan replacement. That's why the term born anew is used, meaning to be born again. Radigan is being born again, but this time in a different body. However, somehow the process failed, because we don't actually see this Radigan as a final product. And this theory doesn't make too much sense, because the rune was described as being of unborn demigods. Radigan is actually classed as a full god. Demigods are the result of Radigan and Renala having children. As we know, Renala is just a human being. That's why their children are demigods. Demi means half. So another theory to explain why we see the red hair is because this isn't a developing Radigan, but it's an indication of his genes. Radigan gave Renala a piece of his genetic material inside of the egg so that they can continue to have children after he left. Not conceiving children in the conventional sense, it's a quite elaborate metaphor. The amber egg represents Renala's womb. What Radigan left can help with the conceiving process. Radigan knew how important motherhood was to Renala, which is why he thought this gift would be fitting. But returning to the term born anew, to be born again implies that something was born previously, so that doesn't really explain Radigan making the amber egg to create children from scratch. The term might imply that the two conceived another child, or children, but there was a complication during Renala's pregnancy. Renala miscarried. That would explain why Radigan gave her the ability to rebirth, to give her another chance at having that unborn child or children again. However, he didn't predict what would happen next after he left. Now, whilst Renala was dealing with her ex-husband leaving and a possible miscarriage, affairs elsewhere in the Lands Between were escalating, specifically between the Academy and the Karian family. Something was brewing. You see, the sources of Rhea Lucari Academy 
watched as their once esteemed leader, Renala, was reduced to a depressed and raving madwoman who prioritized her obsession with the egg over her role as master sorcerer of the academy. And finally, the sorceress had enough. When Renala, head of both the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and the Carian royal family, lost her husband Radigan, her heart went along with him. And then, those at the Academy realized that Renala was no champion after all. The Academy rebelled against the Carian family. This was strategically the best time to launch an attack, as their most powerful member, Renala, was occupied with her personal affairs, and as a result, she was captured and locked away in the Grand Library. Sadly, her heart was broken when Lord Radigan left her. And then, when the Academy rebelled against the Royals, she was locked away in the Grand Library. It's interesting that the scholars didn't dispose of Renala. Maybe because they believed she would one day return to her normal self. Or maybe it wasn't the Academy scholars who locked her away. Maybe. She was put there by the Karians to protect her. If you remember earlier, I mentioned a Karian knight called Moongrim, and Moongrim is located right in front of Renala's boss room. There is no other way of getting to her. Moongrim is the last line of defense. The enchanted knights like Moongrim are allied to the Karians. They serve Renala. And the fact that there is only one remaining Karian knight, Moongrim, at the academy makes me think that he helped secure Renala in the library and then went on to guard the entrance with his life. That would also explain why there is an enormous silver ball trap on your way up to Renala. Moongrim is using it to stop any of the Academy sorcerers from approaching. However, as always, I like to view things from multiple perspectives. So what if instead, Moongrim is not protecting Renala from the outside, but stopping her from escaping, meaning Moongrim is a traitor, a defector. The reason why I say this is because the armor set he wears states that the knights were heroes of the highest honors, but fell into disarray with the decline of the royal family. Disarray means chaos, disorganization, confusion. What if the Karian knights chose the other side to fight for, and Moongrim was a knight caught in the disarray? And therefore he defected to the academy side, which would explain why he exists unharmed at the academy. Let's return back to Renala and her current state, specifically what went wrong with the Amber Egg and its power to rebirth. During the boss fight we see these young scholars who surround Renala, and if you look closely at them, they do have a similar colour palette to Renala. Pale skin, dark hair, feminine features, Interestingly, they have split irises, one half blue and the other yellow. Renala has bluish eyes, and Radigan, although you can't see the colour, I think it would make sense for them to be gold. Most of the demigod children are depicted as having gold eyes, an indication of their godhood. These juveniles were birthed anew by the amber egg of Queen Renala. When Renala got locked away, I think these young scholars were in the library at the time, studying, and as a result, they got locked inside with Renala. So she used this amber egg on them, rebirthing them, not once, but over and over again. Yet their rebirth is not without imperfections, and thus do they repeat the process, eventually becoming utterly dependent on it. This not only explains why they possess shared characteristics to Renala and Radigan, also why they are kind of unsettling to look at. They have been reborn countless times, their genetic makeup duplicating, twisting, mutating. This may also explain why they can't walk. They are stuck crawling along the floor towards their new mother. Rebirth is asleep to them, and with each awakening, memory fades into oblivion. This is all they can think about now. And this is all that Renala wants to do. It's where she is happiest, birthing children, being a mother. The birth symbology, combined with Renala's association with the moon, is very fitting, as it is reminiscent of the Greek and Roman mythology. Selene, Artemis, and Hecate are all goddesses with connections to both the moon 
and femininity in childbirth. The moon advances pregnancies and ripens them into birth. The moon is the source of conception and birth and of growth and maturity. However, as happy in her lunacy as Renala is, it's saddening that all the time she was locked away in the library, she was unable to look up at the sky. The women of the Karian royal family look to the moon to guide their fates, but without access to gaze upon the moon like she used to do, I believe this is also to blame for how Renala lost her way. She no longer could look to the sky for guidance for her destiny. Renala is the moon, and in some ways Radigan is like the sun. Two things which cannot be together. Then there was the moon, and the sun grew weary and began to disappear. She would rise into the sky, flanked by millions of stars. Her radiance was a sad kind of beauty, one that went unnoticed as the people slept. The stars watched her with woefulness, hoping that one day they could get close enough so she wouldn't feel so empty. But they couldn't. The moon was untouchable, surrounded herself with a blanket of darkness through the cold nights. Until one day, when the sun was sliding out of the heavens, he caught a glimpse of her. She was peeking up, a rare side of her being exposed to the light. So just as the stars were wandering into the night, the sun fell in love. How he wished to see her more than the fleeting moments he shared with her at both dusk and dawn. But the moon was untouchable, uncurable, unfreeable. Go, she whispered to him one of those nights, her voice as sweet and sorrowful as the last light of morning. Go and let me breathe. For you and I have decided fates. You illuminate the day. I cast a glow on the night. We will never be. If you would like to know more about what's going on exactly in the boss fight, then I recommend you check out my first ever Elden Ring video, which was analysing all of that symbology and good stuff during the fight with Renala. A lot of what I said in it still holds up now, so if you'd like an explanation on that, please go ahead and check that video out. It's been a real joy to go back and research what I couldn't do the first time. Renala is definitely one of my favourite boss fights. I really just enjoy the whole spectacle and grandiose nature of the boss fight. I think it's truly breathtaking, and that's why it's one of my favourites. Thank you everyone so much for watching and being patient as I made uh, my first video as a full-time content creator now. It's really exciting. Um, I'm trying not to think of it too differently to how I used to make videos. I'm still putting in um, as much love and passion as I did from the beginning. Um, but I'm just really grateful that you've given me the opportunity to do so. Um, if you'd like to support me, I do offer YouTube memberships. And I do do Patreon as well, where you can see behind the scenes of me preparing my videos, ideas, take part in polls, get special shout outs, which I'm about to do now. But yeah, that's just an optional way if you'd like to support me um, and you get a couple of extra perks as well. So once again, thank you so much everyone for watching my video and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Reese's Five, Jawbites, Kyle Coldwell, Hellborn Hero, Retoya Blom, Exile Turtle, Bloodfallen223, Jeremy, Moncaru, Kichu, Jafrakano, Nubist, Chase, Justnick, Kevin H, Tagon Dowell, Tabris, Jonathan Sveras, Tarnished Ozzy, Frankie Felix, Milo Raglan, Daunted232, Dark Souls Weeb, Christify, Lord Horatius, Echo Sandvich, Joachim Westman, Bucky, Liver22, Trip Kennedy, STK True, Mesker, Lower 420HZ, Karcharadon Zastra, Country123, Delinator90, Vinicius Arajo Lego, Yogsathoth, Frozen Over, Matthew, Jacob McComas, Oblivion's Muse, Kayo Motta, Bridget Pettigrew, Goth Reaper, Tim, Caleb Sadlowski, Spartan PK99, Lone Wolf, Bilbo, Isakide, Occult Air, Lord Mud, Joey Vision, 
Omni Rainbow, Motocross Cooper, Reign of Pain, Andrew Haynes, Akura, Justice for Rodan, J Dub, Robert Argenta, Can I Win Please, Django Bob, Fallen Mind, Mr. Alexson, Raglan Strom, Vincent E. M. Thorne, Chester Gordon, Knox Camelos, Julie, David Matteson, Chris Ritson, Michael Schoenher, Law Lover, Marco Rash, Roxy Zeppeli, Levante Trass, Charlotte 96, Mr. H, Shamrock 219, Dan Dingley, Jack Tesla, Eduardo Souza, Brandon Lopez, Dylan Schnabel, Bugboy001, Yoshida May Shoin. Thank you everyone so much.